On the 7th of November 2020, Joe Biden was elected 46th President of the United States, and celebrations broke out all across the country to mark the end of the Trump presidency. Although the footage I'm showing you right now is not from the United States, but from Sarajevo in Bosnia. And here is some footage from January 6, 2021. However, it's not from the United States, but it's footage recorded near Bo Biden Street in Pea, Kosovo, to mark Joe Biden's inauguration. The Biden-Harris campaign actively courted the vote of the Bosnian, Albanian, and Kosovar diaspora in the United States, issuing two letters. These letters, one entitled Joe Biden's Vision for America's Relationship with Bosnia and Herzegovina, and the other entitled Joe Biden's Vision for the US Relations with Albania and Kosovo, outline both Biden's history with all these three countries, and some promises, for example, work in partnership with the EU to revitalize dialogue between Kosovo and Serbia, support Albania on its path to EU membership, and support the sovereignty and territorial integrity of Bosnia and Herzegovina. Now you might be wondering why these two countries in the Balkans are so excited about having Joe Biden as US president. I mean, he's famously Irish, so you know. They say I'm Irish. Only we're allowed to care about him and get overly excited by him, and he also won't shut up about talking about being Irish. The man talks about Ireland a lot in speeches, okay? It's it it I don't even get into it here, but he, it comes up too much and it really bothers me. Like, we get it, Joe, you're Irish. But anyway, the Balkans. You see, Joe Biden has a 30-year history with the Balkans, going all the way back to the early 1990s. He's visited the region on multiple occasions, and on one occasion, as the story goes, he told Slobodan Milosevic, the Serbian president, to his face, that he was a goddamn war criminal. Stick a pin in that one, we're going to talk about that more later on in the video. In this video, we're going to talk about Joe Biden's history with the Balkans, in particular his history with Bosnia and Kosovo, which stem from his support for US intervention in both the Bosnian War and the Kosovo War. We're also going to have to talk about how those wars came to be, and just to what extent Joe Biden was involved in the US decisions to intervene. But first, there are, however, people who will be a little less enthusiastic about Joe Biden's election, namely people in Serbia, as well as Serbs in Bosnia and Kosovo. When Biden visited the Serbian capital Belgrade in 2009, the government banned public gatherings for two days. While more recently, Bosnian Serb leader Milorad Dodic has dubbed Joe Biden a Serb hater. Dodic has been calling for Republika Srpska, the Bosnian Serb entity within Bosnia, to secede. And there's some pretty big historical precedent for how bad things can get when someone tries to dissolve Bosnia. The current president of Serbia, Aleksandar Vukic, had a welcoming, but at the same time not very enthusiastic response to Joe Biden's election. I have never uttered a bad word about Biden. I know him better than Trump. Three days ago, I said Biden was likely to win, but I think it would have been better for Serbia if Trump had won. Vukic has spent the last few years courting the Trump administration. To Serbia, Trump seemed like the kind of US president that they could get behind. As political scientist Yasmin Mojanovic put it, In 2016, an American president had been elected who was himself a nationalist, and a chauvinist, and a xenophobe, and had run on a platform of seemingly wanting to upend and subvert in its entirety American foreign policy. They, Serbia, really thought that this is a guy we could reach out to. In Trump, Serbia had a US president with whom they could get some kind of resolution to their dispute with Kosovo, and who would allow for Serbia to establish a partnership with the US. This seems to pay off in September 2020, when Vukic got to make a trip to the White House where he, Trump, and Kosovo's Prime Minister Abdullah Hoti announced the Kosovo and Serbia Economic Normalization Agreements, which included things like identifying the remains of missing persons from the Kosovo War, rehabilitating refugees, cooperating on building rail links, and removing 5G networks from untrustworthy vendors. It also stated that Serbia would suspend 
trying to encourage other states not to recognize Kosovo as a country, while Kosovo would not apply for any new international memberships. And that Kosovo would set up an embassy in Jerusalem, while Serbia would agree to move its embassy in Israel to Jerusalem by July 2021. Although it appears that um, nobody seems to tell Aleksandr Vukic that. And to move its embassy to Jerusalem in July, that's fantastic. That's a big thing. It's taken tremendous bravery by the President of Serbia and the President of Kosovo the agreement stopped short of Serbia actually recognizing Kosovo as an independent state, which it has been since declaring independence from Serbia in 2008. Oh, and it's worth mentioning that Abdullah Hoti, the Kosovar Prime Minister, who was with Vukic and Trump for the announcement of the normalization agreement, became Prime Minister after the previous government had lost a vote of no confidence in March 2020, a vote which had been supported by Richard Grinnell, the Trump administration's special envoy to Serbia and Kosovo. Grinnell had been a vocal critic of the government led by Albin Kurti's party, Vet van Dossier. Kurti and his party had been attempting to introduce political reforms and root out corruption. Grinnell, for his part, called them anti-American and supported the vote of no confidence which Kurti called a coup against his government. That is to say, a representative of the United States supported the ousting of a democratically elected government which was aiming to rid its small independent nation of political corruption. And all of this happened during a global pandemic. And if you like your symbolism to be firmly on the nose, Vetfandosia is Albanian for self-determination. While this video was being made, the Kosovo general election happened and Vetfandosia won a landslide victory. Serbia does not want to recognize the existence of an independent Kosovo. If Serbia were to give up its claim on Kosovo and recognize it as a fully independent state, this would fundamentally undermine Serbian nationalist mythology. Now, I am going to assume that the majority of people who will watch this video do not know an awful lot about the Balkans, and as a result, might be wondering, for example, why does Serbia not want to recognize Kosovo? Why are there Bosnian people that really like Joe Biden and others who really hate him? What is a Bosnian Serb? And why do Kosovars speak Albanian? These are all very good questions, and I will attempt to, I strongly emphasize the word attempt to, give an explanation to the demographic, religious, and political context for all of this. We can begin. Yeah. Okay. Now, what you see here is, at least in summer or in the fall, one of the nicest views of Ljubljana. It looks like Paris, green leaves, etc. On both sides, nice old houses, nothing special. Eh, but you are wrong. This river here is the official geographical limit between Balkan and Middle Europa. So beware, on the other side, horror, oriental despotism, women get beaten, get raped and like it. On this side, Europe, civilization, women get beaten and raped but don't like it. So, Balkan, Middle Europa, don't forget it. Before we go any further, I want to make it clear I am not an expert on the Balkans. What I really want to get across here is that the Balkans are both geographically and culturally complex. For a start, trying to describe the region geographically raises some issues, as there is no universal agreement over what constitutes the Balkans. The Balkan Peninsula usually refers to Albania, Bosnia-Herzegovina, Bulgaria, Croatia, Kosovo, Montenegro, North Macedonia, Romania, Serbia and Slovenia and sometimes parts of Greece and Turkey. In fact, the Balkan Peninsula, which was first described in 1808 by the German geographer Johann August Zoina, was based on a false assumption. It assumed that the Balkan mountains stretched from the Black Sea to the Adriatic. They do not. Politically, the term Balkans came to mean Turkey in Europe, or Near East, a synonym for areas once part of the Ottoman Empire. In the 20th century, the Balkans became associated with political fragmentation and the idea that its peoples were locked in ancient hatreds. While the view from outside is often that the Balkans are static, 
identity within the region changes and develops just as it does elsewhere. Since the 18th century, it has been depicted as poor, desolate, violent and uncivilized. In Dracula, for example, Bram Stoker called it the center of some sort of imaginary whirlpool where every known superstition in the world gathered, while John Gunther, reflecting back on the assassination of Archduke Ferdinand in Sarajevo in 1914, called the region a wretched and unhappy place. In 1999, Tony Blair called it the doorstep of Europe. Donald Trump recently equated Kosovo with the Middle East. It is a place that the West has to be dragged into because all the people in the region can't seem to get over their ancient hatreds, a term first used by John Major. This perception exists without also acknowledging the West's role in the development of the Balkans. As particularly in the 19th and 20th century, European empires set about reshaping the region and leading the creation of new states. Within the Balkans itself, you have what Militia Bakic Hayden calls nested Orientalism. For example, Serbians might see themselves as European because they are Christian, and view Albanians as other because they are Muslim, while Croatians, who live in parts of former Yugoslavia, that were once part of the Austrian Empire, might consider themselves to be more European than those who live in former Ottoman territory. In the words of Slovenian philosopher Slavoj Žižek, for Serbs it begins down there in Kosovo or Bosnia, and they defend Christian civilization against Europe's other. For Croats, it begins with the orthodox, despotic Byzantine Serbs, against which Croatia defends the values of democratic Western civilization. So, Balkan is always other. Alongside this nested Orientalism lies nationalist irredentist notions of greater states, under which certain national or ethnic groups could all live. For example, Greater Albania, Greater Croatia, and Greater Serbia. An issue with all of these in practical terms is that they each claim overlapping geographical areas as their own. Take Greater Serbia, for example, because Slobodan Milosevic's stoking of Serbian nationalism is a large part of what gets us the Yugoslav Wars and the ultimate breakup of Yugoslavia. A cornerstone of that being Serbian claims over Kosovo. A Serbian nationalist would tell you that in 1389, at the Battle of Kosovo, on the field of blackbirds, the Muslims defeated the Serbs, thus paving the way for the Ottoman Empire to take over and oppress the Serbian people for 400 years. That Kosovo is the cradle of their civilization and the home of their religion. It is their Jerusalem and would form part of Greater Serbia. The thing about the Battle of Kosovo is, from a historical perspective, we don't actually know an awful lot about it. No first-hand accounts of it actually exist. What we do know is, it was fought between a Christian army led by a Serb prince named Lazar. The army contained not just Serbs, but also Bosnians and Albanians, who were at the time still Christian but are now mainly Muslim, and an Ottoman army. This is important, because the cause of re Kosovo in the 20th century made the Albanians the enemy, as though they had been the people who Lazar's army fought in Kosovo and caused Serbia's downfall. However, under Ottoman rule, Serbia didn't lose its culture, religion, or language. For the average peasant, things didn't really change too much. The people who really lost out were the ones who had political power. It was also just one of a number of battles fought between the Ottomans and European feudal lords. The Battle of Kosovo's myth became tied up with religious and national identity. The reality is that 1389 was not the end point of what was a fragmented Serbian Empire, just one moment in its long decline. We can't also really speak about national identities when talking about the 14th century. Pre-Ottoman Balkan states were essentially small political administrative military structures without organic ties to the people administered. The people living in these states would likely have defined themselves by religion rather than by national identity, 
And it would not be until after 1850 that the people in the Balkans began to define themselves along ethnic lines. Around this time, the Orthodox Christian Church, Orthodox Christianity being the majority Christian religion in the region, began to be divided up into national churches, whose only common link was animosity towards Muslims. The Balkans became very demographically mixed under the Ottomans. This was down to the Ottoman system which allowed for free practice of religion. By the mid to late 19th century, you have what Misha Glenny described as a confusing mixture of races, faiths and nationalities. Confusing, that is, to European powers, who, with the 1879 Treaty of Berlin, created the new Balkan states of Romania, Serbia and Montenegro. These states, in turn, constructed their own national identities out of imagined histories and mythologizing. Stories were spun about the glorious pre-Ottoman days and how these new states were historically always the homes of the people who now lived there, a people who were now free from the oppression of the Turks. The Battle of Kosovo is one such legend. However, it is not the sole reason behind modern Serbian behavior it does help to explain a lot, especially when examining how it has been represented and misrepresented by politicians and cultural figures. Yugoslavia was founded following the First World War. It had been the dream of 19th century Southern Slavs to have their own united nation free from the Ottoman or Austrian empires. One where each Slavic tribe would be free and autonomous, but all under one single ruler. The Kingdom of Yugoslavia, however, turned into a dictatorship ruled by the Serbian Karadjordjevic dynasty. Following World War II, the Socialist Federal Republic of Yugoslavia was formed. Communist Yugoslavia was led by Josef Broz, a half-Slovene, half-Croatian, also known as Tito. In Tito's Yugoslavia, Great effort was put into making sure that no ethnic group, particularly the larger groups of the Croats and Serbs, dominated. This was done through successive post-war constitutions and the doctrine of brotherhood and unity. Nationalists were either exiled or jailed, which in itself created a community of extreme nationalists. When Tito died in 1980, he left no individual successor. Instead, there was an eight-member presidency composed of the six republics and two autonomous regions, one being Kosovo and the other being Vojvodina. The creation of these autonomous regions effectively reduced the population of Serbia from 10 to 6 million, which did not go down well with Serbs, leading to the slogan, Weak Serbia, Strong Yugoslavia. There was also, by the early 1980s, a sense among Serb nationalists that they were the victims of economic and political discrimination. Not only that, but that they had been robbed of their ancestral lands in Kosovo. As a result, Serbs, who made up 10% of the population in Kosovo, began to spread false information about alleged mistreatment and abuses of Serbs by Kosovar Albanians. Now. Imagine what could happen if, say, a rising political figure with little interest in the nationalist cause, but a real interest in consolidating his own power, came along. Someone who could harness these radical opinions and magnify them to his own ends. The answer would be a descent into ten years of war and the ultimate dissolution of the state of Yugoslavia. Because this is exactly what Slobodan Milosevic did when he was sent to Kosovo in 1987 to ease tensions between the Serbs and Albanians, Serbs clashed with police and, in the presence of the national media, he told them, nobody will ever beat you again. This was a dog whistle to the Serb nationalists. He never said, no one will ever beat you, the Serbs. He never suggested he was going to liquidate the Albanians, or turn the province into a police state, or lead the whole of Yugoslavia into the maelstrom of war. He needed only to wink at the extremists, and they lined up behind him. This event turned Milosevic into a hero for nationalists. At a time when Yugoslavia was suffering from economic crisis and ethnic tensions were rising, Milosevic was able to combine these forces and build his own mob of supporters. He was then successful in ousting Serbian President Ivan Stambolic, who had been his friend for some 25 years. Soon, 
Montenegro, Kosovo and Vojvodina would each see the installation of leaders who were loyal to Milosevic in what was dubbed the anti-bureaucratic revolution. The result meant that by the end of the 1980s, Serbs had control over the Yugoslavian Presidential Council. In 1991, Slovenia and Croatia declared independence from Yugoslavia. Slovenia was able to secede with only a small amount of military intervention. Croatia, on the other hand, had a 12% Serbian population, and the Croatian Serbs opposed secession. As a result, Croatia entered into a four-year war with Yugoslavia. A year later, Bosnia declared independence. Bosnia had limited military resources and two potential enemies in Croatia and Serbia, both of whom had territorial ambitions regarding Bosnia. Bosnian Serbs rejected the declaration of independence and fighting began. The war in Croatia saw the Yugoslav army draft in Serb paramilitaries who committed massacres against Croats and non-Serbs. While in return, Croatian troops drove Serbs from their homes in Croatia. While the Bosnian war would see atrocities carried out towards Bosniaks, Bosnian Muslims, by Serbs. It is from this period that the words ethnic cleansing first entered into mainstream use. So where was Joe Biden during all of this? Biden says his interest in the Balkans was first piqued by a Croatian Roman Catholic monk who told him of abuses being perpetrated by Serbs in Bosnia and Croatia. I was such a supporter of Israel, he reminded me. And these were Catholics who were being killed here. So why didn't I pay as much attention? On the 21st of February 1991, Biden chaired a U.S. Senate European Affairs Subcommittee hearing, the purpose of which was to assess the situation in Yugoslavia. While Slovenia was already heading towards breaking away from Yugoslavia and Croatia was intent on following suit, the majority of the discussion of this hearing revolved around the situation in Kosovo and the actions of Serbs towards Kosovar Albanians. Kosovo had lost its status as an autonomous region in 1989. The committee heard statements from representatives of Balkan American advocate groups, including Joe Diaguardi, head of the Albanian American Civic League. Okay, please allow me this little Joe Diaguardi digression because, um, one, he wanted to make an Albanian brave heart about the Albanian folk hero Skanderbeg and to cast Russell Crowe in that role. Two, his daughter was a judge on American Idol and wrote songs for the Pussycat Dolls and Christina Aguilera. And three, his most recent tweet is from 2017. And in it, he's being photobombed by the somehow not yet dead Henry Kissinger. None of this has anything to do with the video or the topic at hand but it's stuff that came up while I was researching and I can't not share it with you. So um, that is the end of my Joe Diaguardi digression. We're going to go back to the video now. Diaguardi told Biden of how Kosovo's loss of autonomy had resulted in the repression of Kosovar Albanians by Serbs. Kosovar Albanians had been removed from official positions, had their language and culture suppressed, and their homes searched without warrants. The leader of the Serb National Federation, Robert Raidstone, also compared the situation of Serbs in Yugoslavia to apartheid South Africa. But his statement also reflected the rhetoric of Serbian nationalism, maintaining that the Serbs had fought the Axis powers in World War II only to have been oppressed and had Kosovo the cradle of Serbian orthodoxy stolen from them by the communistic and atheistic leaders of Yugoslavia. The idea that the Serbs had won the war but lost the peace. While it is true that Serbs fought against the Nazis, the Chetniks, the Serbian guerrillas during World War II, were not a homogenous group. There were Chetniks who fought against the Nazis, but there were also Chetniks who collaborated with the Nazis. World War II in the Balkans was also complicated. One of the more interesting remarks made by Biden in the entire hearing was when he chose to compare Yugoslavia to California, as he believed the US state was more ethnically diverse than Yugoslavia, yet it was not caught up in any ethnic tensions, something which he put down simply to the magic of America, a magic which, according to Biden, 
was missing from other countries in the world, such as Yugoslavia and Ireland. Something that is quite interesting about this hearing is that Bosnia barely gets mentioned. There is much greater discussion of Kosovo and Serbia, yet a few years later, the world's attention would turn sharply towards Bosnia when the war broke out in 1992. Bosnia and Herzegovina was the most ethnically diverse state in the region, with three main groups, Bosniaks, Serbs and Croats. When it declared independence in 1992, fighting broke out, Bosnian Serbs fought with the backing of the Yugoslav army, and acts of genocide were committed, primarily against Bosniaks and primarily by Serbs. Joe Biden in 1992 was one of the first to call for lift and strike, that is the lifting of the UN arms embargo, in order to allow the supply of arms to the Bosniaks. This was an idea first suggested by Bosnian President Alija Isabegovic to George H.W. Bush. Biden wrote an amendment aimed at spending 50 million US dollars to fund arms for Bosnian Muslims, which would also be accompanied by US airstrikes. While this amendment passed, it was opposed by the Bush administration. In April 1993, Senator Biden led a US delegation to Yugoslavia. During his visit, he had a three-hour meeting with Serbian President Slobodan Milosevic. This meeting has entered into Biden's personal mythology. It is a story he recounts in his autobiography. Time magazine even shared the anecdote as recently as November 2020. The story goes that during the three-hour meeting, Milosevic said to Biden, you've got us all wrong. And when the Serbian president asked him what Biden thought of him, he replied, I think you're a goddamn war criminal and should be tried as one. According to John Rich, one of the authors of the report into Biden's visit and a former deputy chief of staff for the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, Biden certainly introduced into the conversation the concept that Milosevic was a war criminal. Although there is no official record of the conversation and there was no media present at the meeting, the first recorded reference to this story was a news interview with Biden himself on the day after the report was published. I had this meeting with Milosevic and I looked at him and I called him a war criminal. This guy looked at me as if I said lots of luck in your senior year. This is an absolutely categorical holocaust that's going on on a smaller scale, but nonetheless, mm -hmm. women and children are the targets. And look, Bryant, if we do nothing here, what is the rationale down the road for a NATO? What is the rationale for United Nations? And what makes us think that Kosovo is not going to blow up in Serbia and engulf the whole area in a war? Mm -hmm. While the exact details of the conversation are not recorded in the report, one thing that is recorded is that while Milosevic denied Serbian involvement in Bosnia, he was able to call Radovan Karadzic, the Bosnian Serb president, into a meeting at short notice. It was under the Clinton administration with the Dole-Lieberman bill that lift and strike was finally approved in 1995. Stephen G. Redemaker, who drafted the legislation and brought it to Bob Dole, did not regard Biden as a leader in creating that bill. Biden supported a different version of the bill that would have put the onus on the UN Security Council to end the arms embargo, which, according to Rademacher, was a fool's errand, as Russia would have vetoed any attempts to intervene against the Serbs. It was nothing more than political cover for senators to vote no on Dole Lieberman, therefore sparing the Clinton administration political embarrassment over its failed policy. Biden was ultimately the ninth co-sponsor of the Dole-Lieberman bill, which passed a full two years after his meeting with Milosevic. While Biden was an early advocate for intervention in Bosnia, he can also be certainly accused of beefing up his role. In 1997, Biden said, appalled by the naked Serbian aggression and genocidal attacks on Bosnian civilians, in September 1992, I called for a lift and strike policy. My views were not widely shared at the time. As the war escalated, with massacres, ethnic cleansing and rapes, a few other senators, including Bob Dole and Joe Lieberman, joined my call for action. But it took more than two years of failed diplomacy and a quarter of a million killed and two million homeless before we finally came around to the lift and strike policy in the fall of 1995. Guess what? The policy worked. And later in 2007, 
His presidential campaign would air a campaign video which falsely claimed that Biden was responsible for ending genocide in Bosnia. But to be clear, Biden was an early advocate for intervention in Bosnia. Richard Holbrook, who was nominated for a Nobel Peace Prize for his role in ending the war, said of Biden that he, in no uncertain terms, made it clear to me that the policy on Bosnia had to change and we would make sure it did. He believed in action and history proved him right. While others have acknowledged Biden's consistent efforts to urge US intervention, he was a consistent pest to push people in that direction. There is no doubt that Joe Biden wanted to end the genocide and was willing to use force to end it before either the Bush or Clinton administrations. Ultimately, however, Joe Biden was just one of a number of politicians in the US who called for intervention in Bosnia. He was not even the only US senator from that period who went on a fact-finding mission to the Balkans. Bob Dole, for example, visited Kosovo in 1990 and was labelled an advocate for Serbia's Albanian enemies in a Belgrade newspaper as a result. The Bosnian War ended with the Dayton Peace Agreement in 1995. The war in Bosnia had taken the world's focus away from Kosovo, where since 1989 Serbs had banned the teaching of Albanian and removed Kosovar Albanians from positions in the police force, civil service and education. The initial response of the Kosovar Albanians was peaceful resistance. With their culture repressed by the Serbs, they created their own parallel cultural institutions. During the Yugoslav Wars, the movement for Kosovo independence began. Out of this movement came the Kosovo Liberation Army, or KLA, in 1996. The creation of an armed force by Kosovar Albanians saw, in return, the creation of Kosovar Serb paramilitary groups. In October 1997, violence began to escalate. The Kosovo War began in earnest in 1998. It resulted in 13,500 deaths, with 1,700 people still missing. It also saw the displacement of one million people, mainly Kosovar Albanians. In the US, President Clinton was at the same time in the midst of the Lewinsky scandal, in which he, the President of the United States, was revealed to have had an affair with Monica Lewinsky, a White House intern. And yet somehow things worked out worse for the intern. It's funny that. In early 1999, in the midst of his impeachment trial, the situation in Kosovo was escalating. On January 15th, 1999, Serbians killed 45 Kosovar Albanians in Rachak. Serbian President Slobodan Milosevic insisted that it was not a massacre, but in fact a staged event and the Kosovar Albanians were terrorists, something which Aleksandr Vukic repeated in 2019. In March 1999, airstrikes began. The war would continue until the end of the year. It is unclear whether President Clinton's decisions on Kosovo would have been any different if he had not been distracted by his own political and legal problems, but it is clear that his troubles gave him less maneuvering room to make decisions. Diplomacy that came to rely heavily on military threats reduced the wiggle room even further. For his part, Joe Biden was in favor of action in Kosovo, saying, Milosevic will engage in ethnic cleansing. The number of refugees will be in the magnitude of tens of thousands. The region will be destabilized and our interests will be badly hurt. In a 1999 New York Times piece, Biden tells a story of how he was reading a book called The History of the Balkans by Barbara Yelovich and then refused to lend Clinton this book. All the way down on the plane, I was reading a book about the Balkans, and he saw me reading it. He asked me to give it to him to read, and I said no. Get your own copy, and I'll lay odds that he eventually got it and read it. Beyond refusing to lend the president a book, Biden teamed up with John McCain and co-sponsored the Biden-McCain Kosovo Resolution which called for the use of all necessary force in Kosovo. The resolution ultimately failed to pass through Congress. But the US finally became involved in the Kosovo War when NATO began military intervention in March 1999. Kosovo would finally gain independence from Serbia in 2008. Joe Biden's son, Bo Biden, worked in Kosovo after the war ended training local prosecutors and judges for the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe. In 2016, 
a street in Kosovo was named after Bo Biden, who died in 2015. This is not uncommon in Kosovo. In the capital Pristina, there is a Bill Clinton Boulevard featuring a large statue of the former president. Former Congressman Elliot Engel, another longtime supporter of Kosovo's independence, has a street named after him in Pea. There is also a George W. Bush street and streets named after Woodrow Wilson in Prizren. Wilson was a popular figure amongst Albanians when, following World War I, he insisted that Albania not be divided up between Serbia, Greece and Italy. Now the reason that I bring up that there are statues and streets named after politicians in places like Kosovo is to say, such is the power of the United States for these small, poor countries that acknowledgement by a US politician is a big deal. Not only that, but to have the support and backing or assistance of a US politician, be they major or minor, can have huge effects. And Joe Biden is just one of these politicians, whose profile happens to have also grown exponentially in the last 20 years. He has in all that time remained a supporter of both of those countries, and he has also used his support for those countries to gain political support from the diaspora in the United States as evidenced by his calls to Albanian, Bosnian and Kosovar diaspora in the United States. He's a politician, that's what politicians do. And putting aside his embellishments and his self-mythologizing, there has never been a US president with as much knowledge of the Balkans as Joe Biden, because there are still issues. For example, while I was writing this video, the acting president of Kosovo stated she wanted to talk to the Biden administration about the Serbia-Kosovo economic normalization agreements because she views them as harmful, and the fact that Bosnia has a constitution that has been around for 25 years but wasn't really designed to be in place for 25 years. And then there's Serbia. 13% of people in Serbia view the US as an enemy, and that number is likely to grow with Joe Biden as president. Alexander Vukic may want to cozy up more to Vladimir Putin, who had kind of gone cold on Serbia because they were wooing Donald Trump, and the Russians do have some previous in trying to undermine US-Kosovo-Serbia dialogue. But now that Joe Biden is president, he might actually have a chance to be a leader in US-Balkan relations and not just one of a number of voices. And who knows, by the end of this, he may very well have his own statue and his own street in Pristina. Thank you for watching this video. Like, share, subscribe, comment, do all the things that you people do with the buttons and, and things. I don't need to tell you. There's also a link probably up here or around here somewhere of a, a little bonus video that I have uploaded. Um, context for it is that uh, Slobodan Milosevic did one interview during the Kosovo War and uh, this was something that he said and uh, just, just watch the link. It's silly. Um, I have nothing else to say, and um, once again, thank you for watching, and goodbye.